You're watching Investigation Discovery On Demand. I went to school and this girl named Belinda. She told me to meet, meet her after school at the bleachers. And, uh, so I did, but she didn't show up. And I waited and I waited. And the next day I went back to school and everybody was laughing at me. I guess it's little things like that that makes me have hatred towards them. concept of the wolf. I guess it's almost like a thing inside of me. It's like a wolf that's gone the hunger. It's like some savage. When he did it, all the news crews and Everybody was there. They were lined up on the streets and they were out there because of my my brother. We tried staying hidden for so many years. And my sister May, she hasn't talked until now. I'm hoping this brings her some healing. Many times I have almost backed out of this. Many times, even driving here today. It was like, I don't want to do this. April talked me into it. Can't this just get over? I'm done. I'm tired of going over it. I'm tired of feeling like I did something wrong or I didn't protect the victims. I hate this. I really do. most as him as a child is that he would love to sit and rock on an average day at our house he would always be on the couch and he would always be rocking 
he'd walk in and, and the TV would be on and he would be like not paying attention to the TV and just sitting there rocking. He seemed like he was in his own world. Hey, Roy, what you doing? We would go up and sit beside him and, you know, get him trying to stop and he just would have this detached look. You want to come outside and play for a bit? It was just like, like an empty stare. He was in his own little space. He would just rock and rock and rock for hours. Roy, do you want to come outside and play? No. Even if you tried to convince him to come down and play, he may do it for a short period of time, but then he went back to rocking. That was kind of odd behavior now that I look back at it. But he was the only boy, so we always just thought it was just because he was a boy and didn't want to be with us girls, you know, and do girl things. Come on. Let's go. It was just like, okay, this is what he likes to do. We just never talked about it. You know, we just, we thought it was normal. and we had chickens and we had goats. I always loved to go out and catch the wild rabbits and then we'd put them in a cage so that we could play with them until we had to set them free. One day when we were out playing, Roy brought this limp rabbit up to me and it was dead. And it was one of the rabbits that I had caught, so it was just sad. And I couldn't believe that he would harm this little rabbit. What's wrong with him? What do you mean? When I questioned Roy about what happened to the rabbit, he denied doing anything to the rabbit. I don't believe you. But the look on his face was like, look what I did. It looked like that it had been strangled. That's what I had thought. It's just that he squeezed it really tight. I'm telling mom. I went and told my mom, and nothing ever happened. She just had us bury it. He never really got punished a lot for anything he did. Roy did a lot of bad things with animals, and we just thought it was a phase. She had told me that a neighbor had just called her and said that Roy had exposed himself to her. What's going on? The police are here to talk to Roy. The lady must have called the police because then the police came and talked to him about it. One of your neighbors claims you exposed yourself to her. Of course not. I, I, I would never do anything like that. He said that he was just changing and the window curtain wasn't shut and that a woman walked by and they saw him. That it wasn't him actually exposing himself to anybody. So she seems to think that it was intentional. Why is she looking through my grandmother's windows anyways? She should mind her own business. It was an accident. So you're saying it was not intentional? Of course not. It made sense. And I really had a hard time believing that that's what he was doing. I'll try and be a little more aware of your surroundings when changing, yeah? Yes, sir. I'll do that. Okay. But it was like months, and then it would be another exposure. And then I got a phone call from my sister, who said that Roy got kicked out of school for exposing himself. Roy always had an excuse. How could you have an excuse for exposing yourself and not wearing no pants and a trench coat? I started looking at Roy different. I was so angry, I didn't want anything to do with him. He needs counseling, but nothing was ever done. There should have been something done. 
at that point and when it started because that's that's when his uh, issues with the law got more more serious collecting these wolf things. It was just like he was obsessed with wolf stuff. He said that it wasn't him, that he was out with some friends, and one of them did it. Look, look, I didn't do anything. That's all I know. I just have to appear in court. I'll be back in a few days. During that conversation, he was so calm, and he was just, like, nonchalant. I was just in the wrong spot at the wrong time. I was with a friend. I really didn't do anything. I think you do everything in your powers to believe in your family and to help your family. And so I think that's why I believe you. Okay. Call me if you need anything. All right. I'll see you. And so he went to court. One of my sisters told me that he went to jail. I was really shocked and surprised. It was hard for me to ever believe that he could do such a crime. Savage just wants me. 
just to know that Roy said these words is crazy. And even now, more wants me to have nothing to do with him or to even talk to him. Because I feel angry. I feel torn inside. My heart hurts. And that is because of listening to him and letting him or making him me believe or trust in him for, for so long. It just it makes no sense. she would do that i'm sorry sweetie for a little while my teenage niece came to live with us at our house roy would always take my niece to school pick her up if she needed to go anywhere he would always give her a ride he was good with her it's not fair i would never do something like that to her i know i'm sure it's just a misunderstanding one day when my niece came home from school, she was just really upset because she had got in an argument with one of her friends. Maybe you two just need to talk it out. No way. I'm not talking to her until she apologizes. Roy sat at the table. He just listened. He never really said anything. He just got in his vehicle and left. A few days later, there was a knock on the door. The police came in and they asked if my niece was there. They wanted to talk to my niece because of the argument she had with the girl. Look, this isn't just some dumb prank. It's a very serious matter. They told us that the girl's house had been robbed and vandalized and that there was a hamster that was brutally killed. Whoever did this tortured an animal. There was blood everywhere. It could not have been her. I picked her up from practice, and we came home right after. While the police were questioning my niece, she was upset. She was very adamant she didn't do anything, and, and I knew that she was at the house, so there was no way that she could have done anything like that. We know that you had a fight with her the other day. That doesn't mean I would do something like that. Look, if this is just a prank that got out of hand, if you tell us, we can help you. Roy was there during all that questioning. He never said a word. He just listened. He was just quiet. Aunt May, I didn't do it, I swear. You heard her. She says she didn't do it. So, unless you can prove it, I think you should leave. Roy never admitted to me that he burglarized the house or he killed the hamster. It wasn't until um, after the murders did we all put two and two together. I went in the house, looked around, and there's like this cage. There was this hamster. But I got it out of the cage, and I got a knife. Cut its head off and cut it all up and walk around the room and just took the knife and pinned his head for a reaction. I guess I think he was the early question my niece. And I was there when I questioned him. I was just like laughing to myself. It's just, it's sick. It's almost like he got pleasure out of it. He allowed that to happen to her. Someone that he should have loved and protected. He should have never put any of us through all this. She was sleeping. It was in the middle of the night. And he was standing over her.
sleeping in the house with them while he was home. They're always home. Did you like it better when they were home? Yes. Just to go in there and be in our house, be right next to him, and be like, you know, you do whatever you want. a flyer on my door which said um, keep your eyes open doors locked there was a attempted break-in a few doors down it had a description of the person who tried to break in and it had a sketch on it if I wouldn't have known any better I would have thought this was Roy Roy have you seen this what on our door. That kind of looks like you, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I guess so. He agreed with me that the sketch and the description looked like him, but he reminded me that he was here at the time it had happened. You were? Yeah. We watched the movie on TV. And I said, you know, if I wouldn't have known you were here, I would have thought that, you know, that this fit you. And um, he goes, yeah, I was here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Afterwards, it was never really brought up anymore. We just started locking our doors, but never really discussed it anymore. dearest friends and the relationship was good they dated for a little while and then things got a little weird one day my friend called me up and she was kind of frightened she told me that in the middle of the night um, she woke up and my brother was standing over her, staring at her while she was sleeping. She didn't know how long he'd been standing there. Roy? Is that you? And he had this really, really weird, evil look in his eyes. And then it was like a light switch, you know, and that look went away. What are you doing here? I let myself in. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't know you'd be sleeping. I just really missed you. He finally said um, that he just wanted to come and see her. She was very concerned about that and asked him to leave. Yeah. Okay. My friend put it behind her, but I just thought it was weird. Why didn't he knock? Why didn't he call? But I didn't have any concerns that he was going to hurt her or harm her or anything like that until later. that they made when Penny was missing and they put this poster up all over the place. Roy knew Penny Davis because his girlfriend was living with her parents. Roy helped um, disperse these. He took them around town. They were everywhere. After Penny Davis went missing, Roy became more obsessed with the news. 
and there was a program on TV about Penny Davis's disappearance and Roy taped it and he would watch it over and over again. And he just really was absorbed in food. He did nothing else. I mean, he just watched the TV. How long have you been watching this? A while. Why? The only thing he said about watching the shows over and over again was that he was just trying to figure out if there's something that they're missing. Maybe I can help. I really believe that Roy was interested in the case because he knew her and he was trying to help find her. Looking back now, I realize that he was watching the, the shows and doing the searches more to make sure they didn't find the body. It wasn't just a murder. Someone had to be really angry because it was so brutal. Saturday, I always took my daughter to acting lessons in Seattle. So that day, I um, asked Roy if he wanted to ride with me over to Seattle and back. We had lunch, and then we came back home. And there was nothing weird out of the ordinary. The only stop that we made was at this gas station. When we got home, he just left, and I just figured he was going over to his girlfriend's house. A few days later, we were at the house, and the police knocked on our door, so I answered it. Evening, ma'am. Is Roy Spoonman home? Sure, one second. Roy? That Saturday, someone broke into the Huffman's home. The mom was on the couch watching TV, and the daughter was in the bedroom, and then someone killed them. Huffmans were pretty well known in the community, and it wasn't just a murder. These people were brutally murdered. Someone had to be really angry because it was so brutal. Um, so I'm sure you folks have heard what happened to the Huffmans. I have. Terrible. At first, the police were just asking about Roy's whereabouts, you know, where he was at that Saturday, because they said that there was a phone call made from that gas station to the Huffmans. Well, can you account for your whereabouts the night they were killed? Yeah, actually, May and I went up to Seattle. We didn't get back till late. Roy never became anxious. It didn't phase him at all. And uh, what did you do after you got home? I went to my girlfriend's. Is there a way we can get in contact with your girlfriend? Sure, I can give you her phone number. He cooperated with them. He answered their questions. He wasn't upset. He just, whatever they needed, he was just answering and doing whatever they asked. Well, um, good luck with the investigation. We'll be sure to call you if we think of anything. I mean, I would have never thought in a million years that he would have just killed somebody or killed somebody in the last few days. We all thought, you know, let's get out of this town. So we decided that we would all load up and, and we would go to my younger sister's house. 
As we were driving to my sister's, you know, there was cars following us. And it just kind of felt weird and didn't know why. At that point, I had no idea that Roy was the main suspect of these murders. When we were at my sister's house, we um, heard this noise, like a helicopter. What's going on out there? Oh, you mean the helicopters? I'm, I'm not sure. And I said, is that a helicopter up there? Is it following us? I heard him the whole drive up here. The helicopter stayed over us most of the whole time that we were there. All of us were just talking about how crazy it is that, that they're following us. And so I had told my brother that there has to be something more going on. Why would they be following us like this? Could it be because of you? Maybe. He never really had an answer. It was just, who knows? You know, they're just harassing me. Check this out. Roy, what are you doing? Roy um, went outside and started waving to the police like it was a game, like, no big deal, here I am. I know that Roy had been in trouble a lot. It made me wonder if they were just harassing him or if maybe they had started um, finding enough evidence to maybe um, think he was a suspect in the murder. I walked into work and my friend, the one that he dated, she just walked up to me. Have you heard? And she said, April, Roy was just arrested for the murders of the Hoffmans. Time just kind of stood still. I dropped to my knees, just in disbelief. No, this could, no, no, no. I just kept saying, no, 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 it's not him. It's not him. It can be true. It's not, it's not true. I said, I can't do this. I gotta go. I was excused from work. May lived just a few blocks from where I worked. And I drove straight there. Knowing that the police had enough evidence or enough suspicion to arrest him for the murder of Mandy and um, Rita Huffman changed our lives forever, our whole family. We saw an attorney and he just told us, just let the police do their job and just cooperate with the police and it'll all be fine. She was pleading for him not to kill her, and she wouldn't tell me. Even after the police arrested him and stuff, I did not believe that he did it. I was thinking it can't be true. It can't be true. Not my brother. My brother couldn't murder somebody. You know, he'd done bad things, but never at any time did I think that he could commit murder. After Roy was arrested, the attorneys came to me. Look, we need you to talk to Roy. Convince him to just plead guilty. But he didn't do it. The attorneys asked me to talk to Roy about pleading guilty to avoid a, a long and lengthy trial. It's about what's best for Roy right now. At that point, I got mad. I can't believe you guys are asking me to do this. 
Why should I get Roy to confess to something he didn't do? It was like, you want me to call my brother that I still don't believe that he did this and want him to plead guilty. What aren't you guys telling me? And they told me that he's going to get convicted. I kept asking why were they so convinced that he was going to get convicted. It's not looking good for Roy, so just get him to take the plea, April. And they couldn't tell me why. Uh, all they were telling me is that he will get convicted. It's like, how do I do this? What am I going to say to him? So I called him. During that time, my mom started having nightmares that she was going to die on the witness stand. She just kept having those nightmares over and over again. Look, I know you're not going to like this. I was telling Roy about all the nightmares that mom was having and her fears that she was going to die on the witness stand. All the stress is making things worse for her. So I think it'll be easier on everyone if you just plead guilty. Roy finally agreed that he would do it for mom. Thank you, Roy. I still didn't believe it. I still did not believe that he did it until he told me that he did it. After he agreed to plead guilty for the murders of the Huffmans, he said that he had killed Penny Davis. She knew what was going on. She asked why and started crying and she like grabbed her out and started screaming. I told her to shut up. Goodbye. His voice didn't quiver or anything. It was just like just monotone. She was crying and begging and like, He told me that she was pleading him not to kill her and she wouldn't tell. She would be quiet and she wouldn't tell anybody. And she begged for him to let her go. But she wasn't going home. I told her she wasn't going home. He told me how he killed her. And what she said right before she died. I did be about it. What she said just before I killed her. She forgave me what I was about to do, what I was doing. She says, You're a nice person. Don't know why you're doing this, but I forgive you. for the rest of his life. He should have got the death penalty. 
he's still, to this day, to me, not living up to the consequences of killing these people. I had lots of questions that I wanted answers to, and I wanted to say goodbye, because I didn't want to ever see him again. Did you really kill the Huffmans? And he said, yes. I said, how could you do that? You see the guard over there? Yeah. He says, I want to go kill him right now. He looked at me, he says, I have no soul. And I had a flashback to my friend that he was dating and when he broke into her house and was standing over her. Were you thinking of killing her too? He said he thought about it. I have to go. I said goodbye. And he hugged me. straight for the elevator and I didn't look back. Still to this day, I don't tell people I have a brother. I mean, I'll still always love him, but I will never speak to him again. I will never have anything to do with him. I don't want to. He wants forgiveness. And Mr. Huffman forgave him. And I don't know how he found that strength to do it. Because I can't. Thank you for watching Investigation Discovery On Demand. You're watching Investigation Discovery On Demand. It's hard for me to think about what happened that night, um, because it was really traumatic. Everything was, like, normal, like, and I'm sleeping, and that's when someone comes onto my bed and then they grab my mouth. It's still hard for me to tell the story. I got this call from my brother. He sounded terrified. Seeing like everything, like all the crime scene stuff set up and the police everywhere was just, it was just unreal. I was just an utter, like just utter shock. find out one thing. What kind of person are you? Because right now, we don't know. Is Maggie the type of guy that's a hard, cold, calculated murderer? Or are you the type of guy that made a mistake? You're, you're one of those two people. Not too long ago, I wrote him a letter. I basically implored him to um, try to save his soul and confess and repent. But I haven't heard back from him. If I could say anything to him, I wouldn't just ask him to find it on his heart to please come forward. If he could just help me and my brother and my family to find closure. That's all we ask for him.
one's a picture of all of us at the zoo. I remember these times. These were pretty good times. This picture kind of sums it up a little bit. I mean, my dad looks more serious, but my mom definitely loves hanging out with us. It takes me back. Awesome. Good memories. But it's hard to look at pictures with my dad in it. I feel a sense of, like, anxiety. Even animals and things like that, like, look out for their offspring. I feel like my father, like, just did not care for anything. This guy is inhumane, and there's only one place in, in society for people like this, and this is in jail, and this is exactly where he's gonna remain for the rest of his life. during like an early age and I used to kind of play with just like the bigger kids and stuff that were there. One day I was playing basketball and someone like took my basketball. I went home. Where are you going? Come here. My dad was very, very verbal to us. So if we did something wrong, he would let us know right then and there. Missing something. Where's that basketball? <laughs> Someone took it. Someone stole that ball from you? Uh, my dad was fuming mad. You need to stand up for yourself. What's wrong with you? He was really pissed. His response was like, you're, you're a little punk. You're going to let someone uh, do that to you. You do nothing. I told you to Thinking the sense the ball wasn't. The issue, it was more just like my, my character. I was, you know, like in his eyes, like not tough enough for him. You have to listen to me. You have to stand up and be a man. My dad's instructions were, no, we're getting your ball back. Come on. You were going to the courts. You're going to fight this person, whoever took you. Come on. I just remember being like really fearful. He took me down to the park um, where I lost the basketball at. And pretty much like started going off and wanted me to like fight everyone there. My dad was trying to teach me a lesson of um, standing up for yourself, but that was like a, a harsh lesson. It took me pretty much my whole childhood to, to learn that I could talk out my problems instead of resorting to violence. My dad, when he would get upset, it would pretty much, he'd look calm, look cool, until everything just hit a switch. And then whatever it was, that pressure valve just breaks. And then he's just, just all reasoning is like out. My dad didn't really spend money on anybody. He was beyond frugal, he was just really cheap. So I didn't have like, certain cool things that like other kids had. Like one of the kids in the class had this really cool Karate Kid headband. I stole it from him. And my dad found out. So he told me, go to your room. So I went to my room. I just remember looking out the window and I saw him going out there. I was like, what the hell? I was like, what's he doing? And then I realized, I was like, oh man. He's like looking for a branch for the rose bush. He found like a big branch that had a bunch of thorns on it. And then it's like dawning in my mind, like, oh shoot, I'm about to get whooped on with this thing. I was terrified. And then I just see him like start to come in the house. I'm like, oh shoot. He just came in, just started wailing on me. His eyes, they 
eyes wouldn't be like normal eyes. It would be like, like it would just bug out. Like, how could you? And it would just boom, boom, boom. It just start raging into it. No son of mine, he's a thief. You stole this. How could you do that? Please stop. I don't do it again. He would hit me until he ran out of steam, or until I cried to the point where he would just. It would kind of cause him to like de-escalate a bit. He would just go to his room. We didn't really talk about it no more. The wild thing is I grew up with so much of that stuff that for the longest I didn't even think it was a big deal. But it was like the actual whooping of it wasn't even the worst part. It was just the fear of seeing him cutting the, the rose branch. My father loved money, and it was borderline to worshiping it. Money was more important to him than my mom, than me, than my little brother. I mean, sad to say, it even felt like it was more important to him than God. I remember one day, um, me and my little brother were in the bedroom, and I could hear my mom and dad, like, arguing. I work hard for my money, Maggie. I should at least have a say in how you spend it. Why? So you can be frivolous and spend it how you please? There was a lot of fights in the house about finances. He would just take her paycheck and just literally just give her like small amounts, like five dollars, and, and that was it. Next, you know, it really escalated. You disrespectful woman, you make me sick. Get away from me, baby, please. And then. It sounded like I heard my mom start yelling for help, like she was in distress. Stop, please! You're hurting me, Matthew! It sounded like my mom was yelling for help and my dad was trying to cover her mouth. Listen! Listen! I was just kind of there with Ryan. You know, and I think Ryan was really young, so he was really scared. And all we could hear is, like, like screaming, yelling. <laughs> My mom saying, like, call 911. I was, like, too scared to even step out of the room. So I was just at the doorway just listening, like, to what was going on. And I was just, like, I didn't know what to do. Get away from me, lady, please. She was, like, yelling, help, help, call 911. I was like just really scared and frozen. I wish I could have just picked up the phone and called 911, but I was really like scared of my dad. I couldn't even envision what he would have done if he saw me on the phone with 911. He literally might have just like put me in a hospital or worse. And then it was like just pitch silent. And then I remember my mom just come into the room. And she was like really subdued and uh, she was just really sad. She was like, why didn't you call like for the police? Richard, didn't you hear me calling you? I'm sorry. I was like, I'm sorry. I was just really scared. And then I think she kind of realized too that I was just like too scared to do anything. It's okay. It's not your fault. When I look back on that incident, I think she, my mom hit the point where she was just fed up with everything, with dealing with my dad and the way that he was treating her. And she was pretty much ready to leave. Everything is fine. Don't worry about it. But then, then Egypt divorce is like taboo. Like it's just, it's something completely frowned upon. So between the cultural and religious pulls, I think it was like really hard on my mom. She couldn't really just up and leave and just go. I was 
was working and I remember my mom calling me that she wasn't gonna be able to pick me up that night. And she was always the one to pick me up from work. I kind of had like a gut feeling that things were just like out of the ordinary. Mom, where you at? When I got back to the house, this was the first time I actually like saw my mom like, like battered by my dad. You okay? What happened? Ask your father. My dad had hit my mom with like a closed fist and a hit her eye, and you could already tell that there was like a lot of swelling. You okay? Yeah. He fractured her eye socket. It was definitely one of the, the most traumatic times of my life. Oh my God. Richard must have walked in the door within like minutes after that I came in. Mom, what happened to you? I got home and I remember going in and my brother was down there and my mom was sitting in the kitchen. Mom, this is really bad. You okay? Her nose was bleeding and she was like trying to like still stop the blood. And I was really concerned. I was like, what happened? Did dad do this to you? He lost his temper. You know, she told me that they had been kind of argument and then that he punched her in the face. I was pretty upset. It really concerned me because her nose was still bleeding. This was like at least an hour or so out from the incident and it was still bleeding. So I immediately thought to myself, like, I have to take her to the hospital. Come on, let's go. It set a whole cascade of events because the nurse at the hospital was obligated to call the police and let them know about the domestic violence. I don't think my mom realized that her telling them at the hospital would lead to him being arrested. When me and my mom got home, the cops were there. What's going on? Your husband is under arrest, ma'am. They went upstairs and they pretty much put him in handcuffs and brought him down. This is a big mistake. This is not right. And I remember he was still in his pajamas and barefoot. He was like, well, can I put my slippers on? And they're like, they're like, nope. I want you at least to make a dress. Not gonna happen, sir. I felt really scared because I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know that the police were gonna come and take him away. I've never seen a look in his face like that before. He was just so pissed off. As he walked by, I just remember him looking at me and telling me that this is all because of you. This is your fault. And then the cops just took him right out. They were charging him with domestic violence. The restraining order was just automatically kicked in. My dad wasn't allowed anywhere near her or the house. It was a very scary point because I just knew that our lives would never be the same. My mom was considering a divorce. She kept on swaying back and forth because she loves my dad and he was really manipulative. He tried to spend time with me and Richard he tried several times to like just reach out to us and tell us that he loved us. It seemed like he wasn't bent on revenge at the time, but he was more trying to just get everything back together and kind of make peace with everything. That it put me at ease a bit. One day, um, during the time that the domestic violence case was moving forward, the police came over to the house. They had an anonymous letter. We, uh, we thought you were sticking with us. The letter said something along the lines of, you know, I'm a concerned neighbor, and I just wanted to inform you guys that um, Meg D has been trying to, like, find somebody to kill his wife. to stay anonymous and 
just to let him know that this was something that my dad was thinking about. We don't know who it's from. There's no name on the envelope and there's no return address. So the police were asking, like, do you know who might have wrote it? And, you know, I didn't really have a clue. Do you recognize the handwriting? Does it look familiar to you? I knew he was capable of harsh things and like, even borderline heinous things, but not, not, not murder. This doesn't sound like my dad. I wonder if it's some sort of hoax. I told him, I was like, I don't think he's stupid enough to do something like that. He seems to be okay right now, at least when I talk to him. Things have just been blown out of proportion, really. This doesn't sound like my thing. All right, well, we're gonna keep tabs on you guys. A part of me was just seeing what, you know, what I wanted to see, which was that they would work things out, that he wasn't such a horrible person. I wish I would have taken that letter more serious, but I didn't. It's like, I totally misread him. I hear like a door open. That's when someone comes onto my bed and then they grab my mouth. No! <laughs> uh, remember the power getting cut off? It was one of those things that we just, we didn't see it coming. There was light on the house and it literally just got like, went straight dark. She got really paranoid and she was like, oh my God, why aren't the lights turning on? Why? I don't, I don't like this. Her kind of like uh, pacing back and forth and stuff, like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Trying to test like light switches and stuff like that. What? Why, aren't, why aren't they working? I don't know. It's not a blackout. Everyone else seems to have light. Well, how is this possible? My father loved money and he's so cheap. I just thought he stopped paying the bill. D don't worry. Dad probably forgot to pay the bills. It's just not a shock to me that he would cut the power out on even us as his kids. I'll figure it out. I have an idea. I knew my dad had a bunch of paperwork and shoe boxes underneath the bed. But as I was going through the paperwork, I found out a lot of bank statements for various accounts that my mom had no clue about. At first, I was like just seeing like accounts that were smaller, like they had like a couple thousand or a few thousand. But then I hit one, it was some platinum saving CD. And when I looked at the total of that, I was like, whoa, there's a hundred thousand in this. Mom, come here. <laughs> what is it? And there were multiple accounts that we found. I started piecing together that like there's quite a bit of money. That's there. Look at this. I don't, I don't understand. What is this? We're not talking about just a few thousand here and there, but we're talking about like hundreds of thousands. I was pretty shocked. Believe this, why would he keep this from me? Half of that should be yours. There's a ton of money here. It's like, you know, if you got a divorce, this is half is yours. I don't think she even realized that that was how it worked. He was trying to steal from us. She was in the dark on everything. Finding all those statements and all that stuff kind of made her even more upset. I cannot believe you did this to me. That really set my mom in motion too, where she was like, enough's enough. She was just done. started to me seemed to start mellowing out a bit when i graduated nursing school i saw my dad he came by and i was like man it seems kind of weird doesn't it like dad seems like extra chill like like man he's not normally like that 
It was really nice. It was really nice. It was kind of how I was hoping that their divorce would be just amicable, like around each other. I could have a relationship with him and a relationship with her, like normal people when they divorce. I had thought that he had just come to terms with everything and just kind of like, you know, found peace or something with it. But looking back on it, maybe that was when he kind of like made his mind up like that's it.
The cops came and they told me, like, we're going to need to take you to the station. And we've got to ask you some questions. And then they just started asking, like, a bunch of questions. Like, where were you? I went to my girlfriend's after work. Then my brother called me. And your girlfriend, does she live near your mother's house? I totally felt like a suspect. It was super scary. Why does it matter? Because we're running an investigation. I just remember hitting a point where I was like, all right, I'm not answering any more questions to you guys. Tell me what's going on. Where's my mom at? I just, I, I remember one of those detectives, like, he was just, he was just really blunt with me. He was like, you know, she's dead. She was murdered. They basically stabbed her to death. It just hit me so hard. I was just in, in just utter shock. Up to that point, I thought it was just a robbery. I thought they just broke in to steal some stuff. I couldn't believe that my mom was murdered. No, please. Um, and my... <laughs> I bring a lot of old emotions. I heard Richard just like, just scream like to the top of those lungs. And I didn't know Richard was like in like a room next to me or anything. I just heard him like scream out of the blue. That's when they um, told me that my mom, she, she had passed away. complete shock <laughs> just felt like a sense of like emptiness like right away just didn't make sense this was my mother Harriet Griggs I like seeing pictures of my mom it definitely brings um a lot of memories back into life she's very beautiful in the picture the holidays were really big around my mom, like preparing for Christmas and uh, cooking meals and things like that. Looks like it was actually before she got married. It's like she was like younger and really vibrant. She was just an amazing person, like very soft hearted, very sweet. I don't know what kind of evil person or people could do that kind of stuff. Should get him from work and bring him in to question him. He still went to work. He didn't even he didn't even like take the day off or anything. He just he just went to work. And he had known about it because my little brother had called him up. Even if they were going through a divorce and whatnot, I mean, my goodness, you still check on the person and you know, is, is mom okay? Is are you okay? Like. What is that? It's impossible. I'm sorry, sir. I, I started getting suspicious of my dad. You know, I called him. Right after I called you. I phoned him after calling 911. My dad picked up the phone at about 4 o'clock in the morning, um, off of the, like, about the first ring. And he picked up just like that. His phone was all the way in the living room. So that means that he had to have got out of bed and walk down the hall and go to the living room to pick up. If he wasn't already up, then I don't know how he picked up so fast. It was almost like he was like waiting for a phone call. So I was very suspicious about him. He was crying, but to me it just looked like, it just felt fake. I just felt no, like, real emotional connection with him. I just couldn't stop thinking that he had something to do with it. I 
we, we went back several times to talk to the police and express to them how I was like really starting to think that my dad had something to do with it. And they expressed to me too that, you know, we think that he might too, but we don't have the evidence. So the cops basically like brought up the idea like if we're on a wire. To like, you know, talk with my dad and see if there's any information or anything that I could find out. I met up with my dad. I was really nervous if he found out that I was like doing a wiretap against him. Oh my gosh, that would have been horrible. You might have killed me. How's it going with you and your brother? I was walking a real tightrope because I didn't want him to be suspicious that I thought he had murdered mom. I was just thinking about it. Everybody loved mom. It doesn't make sense. Why her? I was trying to kind of be more like, I can't believe this happened. Who do you think would do something like this? It was probably all just random. He wasn't really telling me like much of anything. Look, it's best if we just put this behind us. He spent a lot of time talking about, like, oh, you need to just move on. And he talked about, like, the house needs to be, like, maintained. The yard still needs to be done. I mean, mom's literally just been murdered. Who gives a about the house? Dad trying to get money out of him for something. It turns out that was actually part of the undercover police team. As time went on, I started being like really frustrated. My dad's just out there like going about his life and nobody's been brought to justice for what they did to my mom. I was feeling at that time like this thing's not gonna get solved. I don't want them to stop investigating this. So I started writing letters to like different like news agencies and stuff. We wrote to uh, the governor's office. I wrote to all the different Congress people. I think we gathered like over a thousand letters. And um, friends of friends, people that didn't even know us were like, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to help and compassionate and stuff about it. And I think we need a little time out if it's okay. suspect, but we weren't getting any answers. But 
uh, one day I received a phone call from my dad's girlfriend. She had left me a voicemail and she was just going frantic. Some gang members had uh, shown up to the house. She was referencing that they're like the people that like came and broken into her house and then it just made my heart race. I literally dropped what I was doing and I phoned the police right away. Hello, I need to speak to whoever's working the area Gerdes case. So I was like, oh my gosh, we have like a, a break in the case. They're like, okay, okay, we'll, we'll look into it, Ryan. I promise we'll look into it. I'm calling back to the hearing. I learned later that that was a sting operation, that two cops were opposed to the gang members. Check it out, man, about killing the one. They were just pretty much trying to get like some hush money. My dad uh, takes their phone number next day. He calls them up and arranges a meeting in person. I think he said, please, everything. 1500 I have My dad agrees to make the payment. He doesn't deny anything in the video. When you see that video right there, it clearly shows you that he's guilty. It really hurts me whenever I see that, that footage because I always feel like this caught him like red-handed, but he still tends to deny things. And it's, it's really heartbreaking to see. I think he's a piece of everything. 1500 I have on me. I mean, that's just a showing of how cheap my dad is. He's still trying to, like, I don't have that much money. How, like, trying to negotiate it down as cheap as possible. It falls right in step with the kind of person he is. That line, I paid you already for everything, really set in stone that, like, this guy, like, had my mom killed. <laughs> how I last saw my dad. This must have been the day that he got arrested. I have no sympathy for this guy right here. This this guy's not my dad right here. This guy right here is a liar. This guy right here is a criminal. This mugshot's like, just sad. I don't even know what to say about this picture. It's just... I feel like this is a picture of what happens when you get caught up in just pure greed and, and evil. It's like, just like, man, why, why'd you do it? It's like, you know, you had so much going in your life. since he was already um, incarcerated for another crime. It's hard for me to fathom the thought that my dad knows exactly who is responsible for the murder and won't give him up. Not too long ago, I wrote him a letter. I basically implored him to, um, to just confess. He's in jail, he's convicted. But at least he could try to save his soul and confess and repent. But I haven't heard back from him. Well, my mom's murder case is still open. I pray every day that we still catch the Slayer. But I mean, I'm, I'm happy that we at least got some justice. At least we caught one person and we caught our dad. And regardless of what happens here, justice is gonna be served, whether here on earth or afterwards, there's justice is gonna be served one way or another.
Thank you for watching Investigation Discovery On Demand.